Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, incoming executive director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of Alan Price, our library director, Stephen Rothstein, current foundation executive director, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Stephen's significant contributions to the Kennedy Library Forum program and his three-year tenure as executive director. Stephen, could you please stand so we can acknowledge you? I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm also delighted to, wel to welcome all of you who are watching today's program online. We thank you all for taking a moment to silence your cell phones. We will be taking questions on cards this evening for our Q&A and staff will walk around to collect your cards as you raise them. Here at the Kennedy Library, we often discuss President Kennedy's important legacies in the area of service, civil rights, innovation, peace, diplomacy, and the arts. Less often discussed is President Kennedy's advocacy for the, conser for the conservation of public land and resources before and during his pre presidency. Notably, his concern for the loss of undeveloped seashore led to the establishment of Cape Cod National Seashore, Padre Island National Seashore, and Point Reyes National Seashore. Following the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which detailed the ne negative impacts of pesticides we're having on the environment, President Kennedy made an unpopular decision to appoint a committee to review the issue, which led to the development of regulations for DDT and other chemicals. In September of 1963, just days before embarking on a five-day, 10-state conservation tour to bring awareness and action to the issues of environmentalism and sustainability, President Kennedy made what would be his last speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations, saying, the effort to improve the conditions of man, however, is not a task for the few. It is a task of all nations acting alone, acting in groups, acting in the United Nations for plague and pestilence and plunder and pollution. The hazards of nature and the hunger of children are the foes of every nation. The earth, the sea, and the air are the concerns of every nation, and science, technology, and education can be the ally of every nation. This evening, we are delighted to welcome President Kennedy's granddaughter, Tatiana Schlossberg, a journalist writing about climate change and the environment. She is the author of Inconspicu Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have. She previously reported on those subjects for the science and climate sections of the New York Times, where she worked on the Metro Desk. Her work has also appeared in The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, Bloomberg, Yale Environment 360, and elsewhere. She is a member of the Kennedy Library Foundation Board of Directors. Wonderfully, Tatiana has agreed to sign copies of her new book after the program, and our bookstore will be selling copies if you are interested. We are also thrilled to, to welcome Rachel Cletus, the Policy Director with Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. She leads the program's efforts in designing effective and equitable policies to address climate change. She is an expert in policies to promote climate re resilience as well as to promote clean energy and drive deep cuts in heat trapping emissions from the power sector. She researches the risks and costs of climate impact and has co-authored numerous reports and articles. I'm also so pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening, David Cash, Dean and Associate Professor of the John W. McCormick Graduate School at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, our neighbor. He has spent his career trying to understand and better harness knowledge to solve pressing policy changes. Before joining the McCormick Graduate School in July 2015, Cash spent a decade in cat catalytic roles in Massachusetts state government, helping to transform the Commonwealth's energy and environmental policy and regulatory landscape. Please join me in welcoming our special guests for this evening. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I love uh, collaborating with the library. Um, as Rachel said, uh, our, uh, the library is our neighbor on Columbia Point. 
Um, it's fantastic to have worked with uh, Steve Rostein for so many years, and I appreciate Liz Murphy's uh, coordination for tonight, and it's wonderful that uh, Rachel is going to be stepping in. We really look forward to collaborating on many, many different things uh, over the next coming years. So uh, it's fantastic uh, to, to have neighbors uh, like this. Everyone should have neighbors like this. <laughs> in fact, my neighbor is here, and I do have neighbors like this. <laughs> so uh, this, this book, it's, it's a particular pleasure for me to be moderating this with Tatiana's uh, excellent book. So if you do not have it yet, uh, get it in the bookstore, have it signed by her. Um, this is a really important book. We see, and I read, many books on climate change and environmental impacts. And as you'll see, she touches on issues that we're not always aware of, that we don't understand the fundamental connections between different issues. Um, in fact, it reminds me when I was in college and uh, there were these table tents that different groups would put up. And, the, and a group, a relatively conservative group that was just getting sick of all of the human rights are connected with oil exploitation, et cetera. They had a table tent making fun of all of us that said, we are in the web of misery. <laughs> and well, uh, Tatiana paints that web um, <laughs> in actually a pretty profound way. And um, a way that shows connections that you, pri that you might not uh, think about whether it's the clothes you're wearing or the food you're eating or how you got here tonight and how we all got here tonight. There are all of these connections that she paints um, in a very powerful way. I think another very important part of the book is that she uses humor. Now, you might not think that in an area that's as serious, many people will, will say that our, our species extinction is on the line here. How could we be making fun of this? But I think with all of the books that I read, to have it interspersed, have the descriptions of these problems interspersed with a humility and sense of humor I think is really important because it touches people in very different kinds of ways that you otherwise would not be touched by. And in fact, if I can just read a couple of things, these are my favorite, having had two kids that were in middle school and having taught middle school for a couple of years. So uh, one of these is about um, agriculture and livestock. You know, there's a lot of problems with livestock. <laughs> Right, and so, I mean, and this is serious stuff, and she has all these facts backing up everything that she's saying. And then she says, um, of these emissions coming from livestock, about 39% is in the form of methane from enteric fermentation, AKA cow burps. Though you probably have heard it's cow farts. It's not farts, it's burps. It's 95% burps and 5% farts. This is important because people always get it wrong. It deserves all the footnotes it's getting. OK, so here we can laugh at this problem of methane. That's actually a huge, huge problem. But I think it makes an accessibility to the issues that's pretty rare to find in this field. We all take ourselves really seriously when we're thinking about environmental degra degradation and who's to blame and how do we solve these problems. So although this is, um, as I mentioned, it shows very difficult, complicated problems and difficulty in even understanding the problem. She kind of paints a picture of doing analysis that makes it very hard uh, whether you should eat organic food that's, that's from far away or non-organic that's from close by. How do you figure those out? And she paints these in a pretty powerful way. And I would say, and I think that you'd agree, that this is a hopeful book. And it's a hopeful book because we have to be educated if we're going to solve these kind of problems. And through the discussion tonight, we're hoping to, to contribute to that education. And so we're going to have, Tatiana's going to talk about various parts of her book. Rachel will have some comments on that. We'll have a discussion up here uh, that I'll moderate. And there'll be, as Rachel Floor mentioned, there'll be Q&A from the audience. So raise your hand if you have a question that you want to write on a card that they'll bring up here. So uh, with that, why don't I give the floor over to Tatiana? Um, well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm amazed uh, on my book tour that people I don't know um, want to come listen to me talk. So it's very nice of you um, all to be here. and. Um, also to be here um, at the library, which um, there are plenty of people who know me here, so it's nice of them to, to have me too. Um, but I, um, and, and thank you for that incredibly generous description of my book, and I hope it, I don't disappoint. Um, you know, I, I wanted to write this book, which is about the hidden and unconscious environmental impacts of all of our stuff, mainly in four areas, so the internet, food, fashion, and fuel. 
um, because I felt like when I started writing about climate change and the environment at the New York Times as a science reporter that there was so much left out of the conversation that might make this issue, which has seemed so, I think, distant and abstract in both space and time, more relevant and relatable to readers. Um, and, you know, I think often the, the scale didn't make sense. You know, we talked about plastic bottles on the one hand uh, and a complete transformation of the electricity grid in fewer than 10 years on the other. And it seemed to me as I, you know, started learning more about this topic that there had to be something in between those two things that might make this issue um, kind of make sense within the lives of readers and help them understand why uh, fossil fuels are so entrenched in, in everything that we do um, and why that makes this a, a particularly difficult problem to solve. Um, and I, you know, I, before I started um, writing and reporting about climate change, I never wanted to read about it because it made me so upset uh, and anxious. And um, I actually felt that as I learned more about it, I became less anxious. And that's not because the problem became less serious, um, but more because I felt like a more informed and responsible citizen, that I understood the world around me. Um, and I felt like I could understand the policies that politicians were offering or if um, companies were trying to sell me a particular product, I could evaluate whether it was greenwashing or whether it was actually sustainable. Um, and so I, I hope that um, by reading this book, readers will, will feel the same way. I also, you know, it's been difficult to, uh, at times I think people don't want to read my book <laughs> because they're worried it's going to make them feel bad about everything that they do. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a book that's about all of our stuff and the stuff that, you know, the things that we do and eat and buy and how we get around. Um, and so in that way, it is about us as individuals. But, um, you know, I think that the narrative of personal responsibility, that's not really what this book is about because I think that narrative has been destructive. Um, I think that it has, uh, you know, made us look inward as opposed to kind of outward and trying to fix and understand this problem. Um, and it has also let those who are actually responsible off the hook, and that's, you know, uh, fossil fuel companies and their lobbyists um, and the politicians who take money from them. And so I think, um, you know, and it's really difficult as consumers to actually make sustainable choices because, well, first of all, everything has an impact, and second of all, we never have all the information available to actually make a choice that's more sustainable. So, um, you know, one of the, the messages that I hope people take away from the book is that I don't think we need to feel individually guilty uh, for climate change, but that we need to feel collectively responsible for building a better world. Um, and so that's why I wanted to write this book. And I will um, briefly give, uh, how much time? Do I <laughs> okay, so I'll give two examples from the book that I think illustrate what I'm trying to get across. So um, one of them is, uh, a, so I wrote about the internet. And um, I think for me and probably for many of you, um, I didn't really think that the internet had any kind of environmental impact at all. And that's probably partly because of the way that we talk about it. We talk about the cloud um, and we talk, you know, we carry it around in our pocket. And so it feels like this sort of nebulous idea rather than a, a physical system. But it is a, you know, it's a physical system of cables and modems and routers all over the world. Um, and in order to send and receive information um, and for us to watch Netflix in our sleep, um, it's, on, <laughs> uh, it's on and it's consuming electricity all the time, um, you know, in the form of uh, data storage um, and, trans and transmission um, and also, you know, just kind of sending information back and forth. And so, um, so it was really interesting for me to learn about that and um, what was particularly interesting was to think about how the, the history of the internet um, has meant that it's congregated in a few physical locations. So um, because, um, so the first kind of big physical network in the US was the Transcontinental Railroad. And so um, the telegram and telephone wires uh, kind of follow the railroad. And so the internet does as well. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, the first transcontinental railroad um, left from Council Bluffs, Iowa, um, and because it provided the most even grade uh, along the 42nd parallel. So um, now Google and Facebook have data centers in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is not really somewhere we might think of as having uh, a lot of internet infrastructure. Um, the other kind of place that is really important when we talk about the internet is Northern Virginia. Um, I think probably when we think about the internet, we often think about Silicon Valley. Um, but we should be thinking about Northern Virginia. And actually, the first Apple store 
in the in the world opened in Northern Virginia. Um, the second one opened three hours later in Glendale, California. But that's kind of less doesn't fit into my tidy narrative, so we'll just <laughs> put that aside. But um, <laughs> um, but basically, you know, the internet was a creation of the Department of Defense mainly as a way for the president to be able to communicate with members of his cabinet in the event of a nuclear attack. Um, and it quickly became clear that it would be useful for much more than that. So a lot of um, IT companies and government contractors moved into the area around the Pentagon where uh, to you know, help build out this new system, um, but also because there was a lot of cheap energy and cheap land um, there and the cheap energy provided by fossil fuels. And so um, you know, now a lot of the internet um, is still congregated in Northern Virginia. The Loudoun County, which is a county in Northern Virginia, um, officials there estimate that about 70% of global internet traffic passes through that county. Um, so it's kind of amazing for me to think that there is this physicality to the internet that we don't often think about. Um, and uh, you know, Amazon Web Services, which hosts a lot of the information um, on the internet, um, they have many data. Um, well, basically, uh, a lot of if you hear about the cloud or you hear about kind of um, data centers, that's basically servers that host a lot of information on the internet, and more and more of the internet is stored in these hyperscale uh, cloud computing areas, and those consume a lot of electricity, both to send um, and receive information, but also because the servers get really hot, and so they need a lot of electricity to be kept cool, so they're air conditioned. Um, but uh, a lot of the electricity to do all of that in Virginia and also in Ohio, where Amazon also has um, some many data centers, it comes from fossil fuels. So in Ohio, about 50% of the electricity comes from coal. Um, in Virginia, about the same amount comes from uh, natural gas. But nationally, we get about 30% of our electricity from coal still. Um, and so it was a really powerful example to me of, you know, I can be sitting at home in New York um, and uh, you know, shopping on Amazon, and uh, it's creating the demand for fossil fuels possibly to be burned in another part of the country. And so to me, it was a really important illustration of how these systems that we think of as kind of only, you know, we're participating in them, but they do really connect us. Um, I'm going to come back in a second to why that particular example really matters. But um, the other thing I want to talk about from the book is um, about Kashmir, uh, and um, I did not think that I would be writing about Kashmir, but um, it actually turns out to be um, one of the most environmentally impactful materials in the world. Um, and um, and so a few things uh, that happened like 30 years ago. So the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Japanese recession, and then the the rise in American consumer demand has. Um, led to the explosion of the goat population in Mongolia and China, which is where <laughs> most of um, the cashmere in the world comes from. Um, and so about uh, in 1990, there are around 5 million goats uh, in Mongolia and China, in part of China. And uh, in so it's, it's very difficult to get a precise estimate of the goat population in <laughs> Mongolia. Um, <laughs> but the, the last data that I could find was in 2004. Um, when there were 24 million goats in that, in that part of the world, representing wow. about 60% of the livestock population. So these goats um, you know, have a tremendous impact on the environment because they, um, when they graze on the grass in this very delicate ecosystem, it's a, like high mountain prairie, um, they pull up the plant by its roots, so it destabilizes the soil. And then they have these really sharp hooves that break up the soil even further, so it adds to this natural, naturally occurring process of desertification, where winds blow this now kind of loose soil across this landscape um, and adds to the um, the Gobi Desert. So, um, and, and additionally, this part of the world is experiencing climate change at a faster rate than much of the rest of the world. So, the average surface temperature of the Earth has warmed by about one degree Fahrenheit. Um, in this part of the world, it's about four degrees Fahrenheit. So it's getting much hotter and much drier. Um, and so that is adding to the process of desertification, and the goats are making it a lot worse. So about an additional 1,500 square miles of desert are added to, um, this, to the Gobi Desert every year. So that's like Rhode Island. Um, and so that has an you know, enormous impact in and of itself. Um, then that, that sand, that dust, is blown east um, to Beijing and other cities where it um, combines with soot from coal-fired power plants and factories. 
and adds to the air pollution there. And then in another five days, it comes to the west coast of the United States. Um, and about 40% of the air pollution in California, by some estimates, can be attributed to dust from Chinese factories. Um, so that was, to me, kind of this really crazy um, and powerful, again, example of, um, you know, if I'm buying a scarf in New York, it's very easy. You know, we think of our clothes as kind of belonging to us, but that it is part of this vast network that connects, you know, me to a nomadic goat herder, to somebody living in Beijing, to somebody living in California. And, um, you know, those impacts are hidden from us, but they, they all exist. And, and you know, it, we are all in a way responsible for them. And I think, you know, in particular, you know, there's a lot of talk when we talk about international climate agreements, um, you know, well, how are we going to get to 1.5 uh, degrees of warming if China is, you know, burning all this coal and building all these factories? And, and that's true. It's a concern. But a lot of what they're making, we're buying. Um, and so we have a role to, to play and also to acknowledge and all of that. Um, and that's why American leadership is so important because, um, you know, we're the largest historical emitters of greenhouse gases and we've outsourced now a lot of our emissions to the rest of the world. So if we're not leading on this issue and taking responsibility for, for what's going on, um, it kind of lets everybody else off the hook. Um, and uh, so that's why voting is so important. And um, another way that voting is so important. Um, so before when I mentioned about um, how a lot of the internet and in general our electricity comes from coal. Um, so the, the byproduct of burning coal for electricity is coal ash, which is um, this kind of toxic dust that contains um, lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, selenium, other um, toxic materials. We, it's one of the largest solid industrial waste streams in the United States. We produce more than 100 million tons of it every year. We mainly store it in water next to um, power plants, and it doesn't biodegrade. Um, and it's can, if it's stored in water, even if it's stored in landfills, it can contaminate the groundwater um, or kind of uh, contaminate rivers and lakes and bodies of water that it's next to, because it's usually kind of in dammed off sections of rivers and lakes. Um, in, uh, to, in 2008, um, a dam holding back a lot of this toxic material um, in Tennessee broke. Um, it released billions of gallons of this toxic slurry into uh, the Emory River in Tennessee and buried 300 acres of land um, in this toxic sludge. Um, most of it was that waste was carted away to um, a landfill outside a predominantly black community in Alabama. Uh, the workers who cleaned it up were not given any protective equipment. Um, they recently won a lawsuit against the, the contracting company that employed them because I think about a dozen workers died and another 200 um, were made sick by exposure to all those um, materials. Uh, it was one of the largest environmental disasters in American history. I had never heard of it. Mm. Um, I had never heard of coal ash mm -hmm. at all before I started writing about climate change and the environment, and that's part of the problem. Um, it's a luxury to not have to know what coal ash is. Um, but you know, I'm a privileged white person who lives in New York City, and I don't ever have to think about it. But for millions of Americans who um, drink water contaminated by coal ash or breathe air uh, with this with dust in it, um, they don't they don't have that luxury. And um, the federal government put in place the first ever regulations governing the disposal of coal ash in 2015 after this a spill in 2008. Uh, it was the first set of regulations that Andrew Willer undid when he became uh, EPA administrator. And they, recent, they released last week um, their new their replacements, which, as you can imagine, are um, a gift to the coal industry. Um, and so, you know, that's, to, to me, uh, you know, um, a, a society that, and, and also the, the people who are exposed to coal ash pollution are disproportionately um, communities of color, low income communities living in rural areas. And so a society that allows people to suffer disproportionately from this kind of pollution um, because of their race or income or where they live is a society that's less just and less free for all of us. And, um, and so that's why, you know, I think it's really easy to, to forget that um, regulations uh, like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, you know, that, that they affect all of our lives because it, we, I think, you know, me, I've never lived in an America where the EPA didn't exist. Um, so I take that for granted, but um, clearly we can't take that for granted anymore. And so, I, you know, that's another reason why 
um, you know, voting matters so much is because these agencies really do um, have a profound impact of, on our lives every single day. Um, and so when people ask me, well, what can I do about climate change, I say, the, you know, the most important thing to do is to vote. And then they're like, well, what about red meat? And then uh, <laughs> and I say, no, it's to vote. Um, you can do that, too. Um, and then, the, you know, the second most important thing to do is to put pressure on uh, companies to um, act more responsibly or at the very least um, be transparent about their practices so that we can make sure that they're, um, what, you know, we can find out what they're doing and then make sure that they do better and hold them to that. And the third most important thing is to talk about climate change. Um, because only about a third of Americans say that they talk about climate change at all. Um, but once they do, they're more likely to consider it a risk and to support policies to mitigate it. And so, um, you know, but it's also important to listen when we talk about climate change. And, um, and so I think, so, th so those are the three kind of most important things. And I, and I hope the three things that people take away from, from reading my book. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm so tempted to dive in and start asking lots of questions, but we are so fortunate to have Rachel Cletus here who works for the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I know as a, as a policy analyst and scientist, these are issues that are near and dear to your heart, and you probably don't read books that are quite like this um, all the time, but it would be great to hear your, kind of your angle on this. As, uh, Thank you, and thank you all for being here. It's such an honor to be in this space, and uh, Tatiana, it was such a pleasure. I uh, was this book arrived by Amazon uh, this weekend, <laughs> and uh, I I thought, oh, you know, I might just have a chance to briefly skim it, but I just got sucked in right away. I've got my sticky notes all through the book. I talked to my daughter, who's 13, about fast fashion. She loves Forever 21, so that was. Uh, she didn't quite see it the way I did. But, um, <laughs> but to me, what was uh, immediately compelling about this book is uh, the scientific method that you practice as you go about uh, this book. Because it's about, it's very relatable. It's about everyday things you and I do. Uh, for those of you who may not have a chance to read the book, it's about things like buying from Amazon. It's about uh, you know, the clothes you wear, uh, the food you eat, and the food you waste in your refrigerator. Um, it's about how we're all connected and the ways that Tatiana was just describing as a community at the local level, but also globally. Um, and at each step, uh, she's searching for answers. And what I love is that you don't give short shrift to the process that it takes to get to those answers. It's not always easy. It's not always straightforward. Um, and sometimes uh, it's an I don't know, or it could be this, or it could be that. Um, personally, I found uh, the bit about Bitcoin mining really interesting because it's something I don't understand either. So, so like, what is Bitcoin? I know I'm supposed to know what this is, but so it's something to do with blockchain and Bitcoin, and there's there's lots of things in there. But it's really demystifying uh, complex topics and just bringing them back to ways people can relate to. And it's the power of narrative and storytelling that that I found amazing about this book. And I spend most of my uh, daily uh, life at work thinking about climate change and clean energy, uh, climate impacts and clean energy solutions. And there's a lot of that in this book. But what's equally obvious is that climate change isn't a problem that we're going to solve in a corner by itself. It's so connected to all these things. So coal-fired power plants are a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, but they've also got the coal ash, uh, toxic coal ash associated with it. Um, and so on one hand, that just makes problems multi-layered. You've got climate change, but you've got all these other uh, pollutants associated with it. But on the other hand, uh, it, it's so uh, appealing to think, wow, if we uh, found solutions that shifted us to clean energy, we'd solve five problems at the same time. And that's the power here, recognizing that the fact that these problems are connected and multi-layered also means that our solutions can help deliver on many fronts. We can be solving climate change that's really going to matter to our children and grandchildren, but we can also be solving the immediate problems that are contributing to a disproportionate rate of asthma in communities of color. Um, so this is the, the power of bringing these solutions together and making the solutions intersectional. Uh, what I also uh, loved about the book was uh, the ways in which justice was centered in the book without making anyone have to feel moralistic or guilty, depending on which end of the spectrum you are. 
but it's just matter-of-factly wo woven through the book. Uh, I, I just wanted to read one little piece that really grabbed me, which was, sorry, I'm not going to find the page when I need it, but it was uh, on the chapter on food waste, which basically uh, pointed out that at the same time that we're um, wasting all this food, mm -hmm. so somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of the food we produce is wasted, and it comes at huge financial cost. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, huge waste of resources, energy, food, water, fertilizer, and despite the fact that about 12% of Americans don't have enough to eat. Mm. So there you have it, it's mm. the facts. Mm. And having those facts is really important in terms of motivating us to action. Not to guilt, not to curl up in the corner in a fetal position, but to motivate us to action because, hey, this is, this is a problem that's got a solution. There's such a clear win-win here. Nobody's getting anything about, out of wasting food, right? There's no satisfaction. There's, you're not drawing any utility as a consumer from wasting food. So clearly there's a solution here that can uh, improve uh, and work to the benefit of everybody. Um, the, the other piece that, I really, uh, re that really resonates with me is the fact that you point out that individual actions matter, and it's the collective that we also need. So these things, it's a both and. Uh, we're not going to solve this problem just by thinking about our individual choices, but our individual choices and the kind of action they can motivate in the world collectively can add up to a lot. Um, so. We need both of those pieces, and this is why uh, Tatiana said it several times in her comments, but I will repeat it again. Vote, it matters. Vote for facts. Vote for people who understand science and want to center solutions that are led by science and that have equity centered in them as well. Um, that's the only way we're going to get to the kind of deep, sustained, large-scale changes that we need uh, as a global community to confront challenges like climate change, like poverty, like lack of access to uh, health care and education. Um, so big picture, uh, you know, we know what we need to do uh, to address the climate challenge, for example. We know uh, from various scientific reports like the IPCC 1.5C report uh, that we really need to do everything we can to constrain temperature, global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 C. To do that, we're going to have to make a global shift to uh, clean energy to get to net zero emissions by mid-century. That means energy efficiency. Uh, that means cleaner electricity, getting our electricity from wind, solar, and other low carbon uh, forms of electricity. It means electrifying a lot of our end uses, so for example, moving our transportation and industrial and buildings energy use over to electricity that's now clean electricity. And it also means uh, making sure that at the same time, we are investing in climate resilience because we've locked in, unfortunately, a lot of climate impacts. We're observing it around the world even now. Just over the weekend, we had news of these incredible uh, wildfires in Australia near Sydney. Uh, there was a typhoon that hit India, cyclone that hit India and Bangladesh. Uh, there's a drought unfolding in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here in the U.S., we've had these terrible wildfires in uh, uh, California. We've had a year where Hurricane Dorian, this terrific intensified hurricane, hit uh, the U.S. We've seen record flooding in the Midwest all along the Mississippi. Uh, so. Climate impacts are here and now. This is about our current, but it's also about the kind of future we want to leave our children and grandchildren. Um, and the one piece uh, that I would say is important in thinking about our choices is not just about the emissions and the pollution side, but also the kinds of choices we're making to make sure that we're building climate resilience. So uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we are here in a, in a city that's a coastal city. We know that sea level rise uh, is worsening, uh, flooding now uh, contributing to uh, uh, and will contribute to even more flooding in the future as sea level rises. And that means we have to start thinking about where are we putting people and property? Are we making sure that we're not uh, exacerbating the harm by putting more people and property in harm's way? Can we be, do a better job of being guided by the science there? Because uh, there is a lot of good science available now, including from uh, my own organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists, pointing out that this kind of flooding is going to get worse uh, because of sea level rise. And yet, we're still choosing to locate a lot of critical infrastructure buildings and people in these coastal flood zones. Uh, so 
The other part of our choices, I think, is to be informed about the kinds of risks that are coming our way and make more resilient choices individually as well as collectively as a nation, um, and to recognize our role in the global community. Uh, the one thing uh, about being in a space like this is to remember a time when our country was not uh, an isolationist country, when our country understood that we had a common destiny with the rest of the world, and the best of human aspirations are achieved when we work together as a global community. Uh, so as we solve the challenge of climate change and many, many other profound challenges, let's remember uh, that that is a deep part of the American ethos, to see ourselves in the world uh, uh, leading the way, but also alongside, working alongside others. Um, and I'm going to say it again, vote, it matters. <laughs> well, great. My, my, uh, thank you, Rachel. So um, my first question for, for both of you is actually about that, that take home message of voting because I'm just going to follow the log logical kind of chain that that means because we vote then we get people in office who understand care about this issue and want to put in place policies that can help solve it and I think a lot of the despair people have is this is such a big problem what are the kind of policies to solve this kind of issue so if you were to kind of summarize how would a policymaker think about these kinds of issues? You may want to talk about externalities. I had promised myself as having been a somewhat economist, I would never say that word publicly. But, uh, and you could tell by the lack of people that laughed that they didn't know what that meant, and so I was right. Um, but if you could kind of explain, I mean, how do you deal with things like externalities? How do you deal with equity issues? And I'm glad that you both raised those. I do think that's a really powerful part of this book. How do we deal? with when we're talking about government that should be more inclusive with communities that historically have not been empowered to engage in the democratic process and continue to be that way. How, how do we solve these problems in that kind of context? If you could touch on just high level, what would be the ways that you'd think about policies to solve these issues? Well, you do more policy. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I think um, one of the things that I, I think about a lot is um, you know, when we think about, for fast fashion, for example, um, you know, the clothes are cheap uh, because no one actually pays for the cost of producing them. Um, and, um, you know, it's cheaper to produce something in China and ship it here because no one pays for things like ocean acidification or sulfur dioxide pollution or, you know, black carbon and the effect that has on the polar ice caps. Um, you know, in addition to the um, healthcare costs for the workers who produce the clothing um, and what happens when they get into landfills in this country and produce methane emissions or, uh, you know, uh, pl leach plastic um, plasticizers into, into the environment. And so one thing that I, I think about there is that, um, you know, there, there has to be a better system in terms of managing externalities for how we price those things or how companies are held accountable to um, including those effects in their models of profit, I guess. Um, because somebody actually does pay for the cost, like we pay for the cost in terms of the ecosystem health or the health to the oceans or the healthcare costs to people. Um, and, and we also pay for the goods and allow the, the companies to profit. And so that's kind of a, in a really important way that I, that I think about equity and then, you know, the kind of next question from that is, well, what about people who need those clothes or, you know, can't afford better made clothes? Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's a really important question and one that kind of gets to the heart of this, this equity question. But I also think if you have regulations in place that manage those externalities, um, if you have, then all of the products will be more sustainable. Um, and so it'll kind of eliminate the responsibility on the consumer to make the sustainable choice. Um, if you think about light bulbs, for example, you know, if you eliminate incandescent bulbs from the market, then people don't have to decide if they should buy the incandescent bulb or the LED bulb. Um, and so, you know, that's one really important way to think about it. It's difficult to imagine kind of a specific policy prescription that, that would deal with something like that, but I think it kind of goes to the heart of what a lot of people um, who look at this problem is particularly through the lens of um, equity find, which is that, you know, there is a need to move beyond a model of where GP, uh, GDP is the only way that we kind of value growth and success. Um, and so that's kind of an abstract um, uh, idealist answer to that question. But I do think, you know, 
kind of managing ex externalities and pricing things and having regulations uh, on companies in place if they're not willing to take those steps themselves is, is something that's really important. If I, if I can just have a, a little aside to illustrate this point <laughs> a little bit, and, and that is, so how many of you have heard the term, we have to put a price on carbon? How many of you have heard that? Okay, so it looks like about half. So it's often part of the conversation that Tatiana is talking about, and when she says internalizing the externalities, all those externalities are the things the company doesn't pay for, the ocean acidification, the methane release, all, health care impacts, all that kind of stuff. And so what putting a price on carbon means is taking all of those impacts that carbon in the atmosphere has, rising sea levels, damaged buildings, increased asthma, all of those kinds of things, and forcing the company that sells fossil fuels to put that cost in the gasoline we buy, in the gas in our house, you know, all of those kinds of things. So when you hear price of carbon, what they're really saying is force the company that's selling you the stuff to really take into account all of the costs, not just how much the factory costs and the labor costs, but all of the costs. Internalize those externalities through a price. Lecture done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so uh, here's the thing. We don't, we have lots of solutions available to us. What we've been lacking is political will. And that's why this vote thing really matters because uh, we have technologies available today, right now. Many of you uh, are obviously been following the news about wind and solar. We've seen double-digit cost declines uh, in the last 10 years every annually. Uh, we uh, have been seeing an incredible ramp up in wind and solar, both here in the US and uh, globally. By 2020, we're on track to be 20% renewable energy here in the US, both hydro and non-hydro included. Um, and that extraordinary pace of growth didn't happen by accident. Uh, it happened because we have uh, these things called renewable electricity standards in many states that set a goal uh, for utilities to meet in terms of how much electricity is being generated from renewable sources, set a goal, and, they, and off you go to the races. And it's been no trouble meeting these renewable electricity standards. Nationwide, they're, they're now in operation uh, in half the states. Uh, many states have gone in and raised these renewable electricity standards over time, recognizing that not only have the costs come down, but they're helping deliver public health and economic benefits. Uh, there's broad bipartisan support for renewable energy around this country. We've got a lot of that electricity being generated uh, in so-called red states, Texas and the Midwest, et cetera. So there are obvious things we can do like that, building on experiences that we've had. The other thing that's helped is having a production tax credit and an investment tax credit for renewable electricity standards at the federal, uh, for renewable electricity at the federal level. These kinds of policies, there's no silver bullet solution, but these policies work well together to help deploy more renewable electricity. The challenge we have right now is business as usual is not good enough. We've got to accelerate this momentum. We've got to create a lot more. That means we've got to have policies in place that put a price on carbon, uh, set standards for clean energy uh, in the electricity sector, but also for electrification in other sectors, move more of our transportation uh, energy use over to electricity. We've got to invest in energy efficiency in buildings, efficiency standards, building codes, um, and the way to make this equitable is to make sure that the burden of this is not falling disproportionately on low-income households. There needs to be uh, special investment, targeted investments in public housing for low-income households so that they're shielded from any uh, potential price increases in energy that might come with some of these uh, policies in the near term. Um, and then uh, there are obvious things we can do in the land sector. You know, uh, land, uh, safeguarding our forests and soils is a great way to store carbon. And we can engage in the kind of agricultural practices that both advance sustainability of our uh, agricultural systems as well as have more carbon stored in the soils. We can manage our forests in a more healthy way to ensure that as well. Uh, so there are a lot of solutions available. I mean, there are too many to even say out loud here. The, st the challenge has been the political will to really enact this on the scale that we need. And the EPA has a very important role to play in making sure that as we're implementing standards, we're also safeguarding the public's health. 
which is really important for issues like the toxic coal ash uh, issue that you uh, raised. Uh, so getting our EPA back to actually delivering on its mission to protect people and the environment, that would be a huge change uh, from where we are right now. Okay. Thanks. That's what talking about. So, so here, here's a question. Um, Tatiana, you had mentioned that only a third of the people in the, in the country talk about climate change. And Tatiana wrote, with two other authors in the New York Times, wrote this great article a couple of years ago that um, showed maps that showed a variety of different ways that people have opinions about climate change. And one of them is these regional differences in how people think about climate and weather, emissions controls, et cetera. So here, here's a question. I know that you, you were talking about the book tour that you've been doing, which has been primarily on the East Coast. And if we were not here in the JFK Library in Boston, but we were in the Gerald Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or the George H.W. Bush Library, Presidential Library in College Station, how would you, would you, and if so, if it were different, how would you approach how you communicate these kind of issues? Both of those areas are areas that were the color on your map that showed people didn't really think about or care about climate change that much. Um, it's, a, it's a good question, and I think, you know, as you may have noticed when I was speaking about my book, I didn't actually really talk that much about climate change uh, or climate science. And um, that's, I mean, I talked a little bit about it, of course, but I think um, there are ways to talk about this issue that actually don't bring up kind of climate change, and not that we shouldn't bring up climate change or that it's not important, but because it has become both uh, such a partisan issue and such a kind of um, moralizing issue in a, in a way that I think has been destructive. Um, it is possible to have these conversations just by talking about kind of some of the effects of pollution um, and how, because usually the things that are polluting are also bad in terms of climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think, uh, and, and also, you know, those those things they hurt all of us. So if it's, if you know, you're in a community, a particularly agricultural community, a place where they use a lot of fertilizer to grow their food, um, that produces a lot of runoff, especially if there are floods, as there were this past year. Um, you know, I mean, the, the flooding in the mid Midwest meant that people couldn't plant their corn or their soybeans and, and lost a tremendous amount of their crop. But most of the time, it also means when you have a lot of fertilizer runoff that it's polluting the drinking water of those communities and causing things like blue baby syndrome. Um, and those communities then have to drink bottled water. Or it produces, um, you know, if you're in the, on the Gulf Coast, it produces an enormous dead zone um, in the Gulf of Mexico, which, you know, not only um, kind of has huge ramifications for that ecosystem in terms of the health of the organisms that live there, but also affects tourism, um, affects, you know, all kinds of regional industries. And so I think um, there are plenty of ways to illustrate how this system doesn't actually work for anybody and how it costs all of us so much without actually getting into the question of is climate change happening or not? Do you believe in it as if it's a question of belief um, <laughs> when it's not that? Um, so I think you know that's kind of how, how I often think that might be an effective strategy for talking about this, which is to show the, the ways in which we all suffer from this. And um, you know, a lot of the policies that, um, that Rachel just mentioned, um, I mean, we often talk about climate change as if um, kind of enacting a lot of these policies or this transformation of clean energy will be an enormous sacrifice um, in terms of the, kind of the economic impacts, which like, first of all, not doing anything will cost a lot more. Um, but also, you know, there are a tremendous amount of benefits. And, uh, you know, if we don't burn fossil fuels, we don't have to deal with fossil fuel pollution. And, that, and that's better for everybody. And a society that is lower carbon, less wasteful, less polluting is a society that's better for everybody. And so I think it's important to kind of stress those, um, those parts of this as opposed to kind of getting into these areas where it's just so easy for people to, to shut off because of how their particular tribe might identify on this issue. Mm -hmm. Rachel, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think that uh, it's really important when you're having conversations with people to be treated just like how you would like to be treated, which is meet people where they are, uh, understand what their daily life concerns are. Uh, it could be uh, drinking water uh, quality. Uh, it could be asthma. It could be jobs. Uh, it could be the fear that 
by speaking out against uh, fossil fuel companies, you're going to threaten their job in the future, if not right now. And that, uh, for me, someone uh, who's working in Cambridge, Massachusetts, do I even understand what that looks like uh, for someone who is earning a livelihood from the fossil fuel industry right now? So I think it's really important not to uh, assume that you understand all the nuances about how this is going to play out. Because if we say climate change touches everything right now because of these climate impacts, then the solutions are going to touch everybody in some way or the other. And understanding how that will play out for different people uh, in different places is, is really important, pointing out the opportunities there. Um, one thing that I think is true wherever you are in the country is there, there is this sense that uh, there is a growing disconnect between the rural and the urban, and uh, that uh, people are, are really struggling in rural areas uh, to uh, safeguard a way of life that seems to be disappearing before their eyes. Um, and that's something that I think uh, it's worth having a little humility about and understanding what that must feel like. Uh, there is a, a, a growing recognition, though, uh, that uh, the kind of inequality that's getting entrenched in our country is not serving anyone well, whether you're rural or urban. So uh, last week, for example, uh, Murray Energy declared bankruptcy. Murray is uh, one of the biggest coal uh, companies uh, in the U.S. and. Uh, there have been a, a, a rash of coal company bankruptcies in the last few years because coal is getting increasingly uneconomic in the marketplace relative to other forms of energy uh, like renewable energy and natural gas. Um, and there's been this rhetoric out there that a lot of what's happening to roll back these regulations like the coal ash regulation is to protect the well-being of uh, coal miners and coal mining communities. Uh, but that's cheap political rhetoric, and it's so clear when you see what's happening right now, because Murray uh, asked for a lot of these uh, regulations to be rolled back. The company is going bankrupt nevertheless, and uh, the first thing that will be on the chopping block will be the coal miners' pensions and medical benefits uh, and their jobs, frankly, eventually. Uh, but we don't hear a peep from this administration about doing anything to actually help those miners right now in safeguarding uh, their uh, uh, pensions, their medical benefits, et cetera. So separating the interests of CEOs who often walk away from situations like this with uh, their finances completely intact from uh, the lot of the ordinary person is really, really important uh, for when you open up conversations, whether it's about climate change or, or something else. Um, and then finally, sometimes you have to recognize you're not the person to open that conversation, uh, that someone that they trust, uh, their minister at church, uh, their uh, union, uh, fellow union member, um, the person uh, that they meet at the grocery store, or the person they sit at the Thanksgiving table with, is the better person to, to broach this message. Uh, and maybe it's not my place sometimes. Um, I have a, a, a somewhat related question because, thanks, because um, I mean, you clearly outline so many of the interconnected problems with a variety of things that we, that we purchase. Uh, there's another great section on roses, for example, that are now largely um, grown in Colombia and flown up here um, at great expense and emissions. Uh, my wife is here also. You're not getting roses for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's my fault. Yeah, it's your, right. <laughs> Blame it on Tatiana. But um, you do mention throughout in a kind of short kind of way, but I'm wondering how you think about it philosophically, is that probably for each one of these stories you tell, there's a story about development or a, dist or a story about lifting out of poverty. The Rose one, for example, uh, you, you mentioned at the end that 130,000 people in Colombia now have secure jobs and they're not going into the cocaine trade. A lot of benefits from that, not just from them, but for future trading of cocaine, et cetera. If you think about all of the devastating agricultural impact by industrial agriculture, hugely problematic, but it's also caused uh, hundreds of millions of people to be lifted out of poverty and to have healthier lifestyles. H how do you kind of think about those kind of trade-offs? Yeah, it's really complicated, and I think, you know, food is a really good example because, um, you know, we often talk about the problem with industrialized agriculture or, you know, 
people have particularly strong positions around genetically modified crops or fertilizer use or pesticide use. But you know, some of those developments in the Green Revolution have allowed the global population to grow from you know, a billion people in 1900 to six billion people by the end of the century. Um, and most of them, most people now have enough to eat, which is amazing. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really, or, you know, when I was talking before about um, kind of the pollution coming from Chinese factories, I mean, that the growth in China of their industries have lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty. And, um, and so there are really important considerations and, and trade-offs um, with, with some of the policies that we have in place, in part because of some of the things that Rachel mentioned. You know, I mean, if you move away from coal or natural gas, there are people whose jobs are affected by those sorts of things. And so and it is really important to um, always be thinking about equity and justice. And you know, in some of the, um, the presidential campaign, Jay Inslee in particular talked a lot about a just transition, or we hear a lot about that with the Green New Deal. And that's what that means, which is investing in those communities and also um, listening to stakeholders in those conversations um, and, and not leaving people behind. Um, but you know, it's. I think that there are also. I mean, focusing on that and saying, well, we can't do anything because then, therefore, those people will fall back into poverty or not have enough to eat. That's kind of operating on the same model as of business as usual, which is that um, those people get left behind if you kind of get rid of those things and don't replace them with anything. Which is what I think a lot of the kind of arguing against climate action presumes. Um, but there will be other things that replace those systems or better systems that replace those systems. I mean, for instance, here, um, you know, two thirds of crop calories in the U.S. don't feed people, um, and in a lot of the kind of midwestern corn belt states, they're not allowed to grow crops that people eat. Uh, I mean, they have to grow corn and soybeans; they can't grow broccoli, um, and that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, and you know, part of the problem is the, the way that our political system is designed is like the first presidential contest is in Iowa. And so Iowa has lost 99.9% .9 of its native tall grasses to corn. Um, and so you know, it's, it, there are a lot of people who have a lot of um, kind of interest in, in keeping that system the way that it is. But that system doesn't really work well for anybody because um, we use a ton of fertilizer, water, energy to produce that corn that doesn't feed people, that makes meat that's not healthy, <laughs> that produces a ton of um, methane pollution. And so that's a system that needs to change for the benefit of everybody um, and probably at much, um, a much smaller cost. Um, so I think, you know, you have to kind of imagine these or dream of these kind of more radical transformations because that is what is required, but that also will be better for, for more people. Yeah, I think it's quality uh, that matters, not quantity. So uh, the folks who are producing those roses, uh, they're not eating the roses. They uh, are stuck in a system mm -hmm. where we want cheap roses in our grocery store, and we only want to pay the bare minimum for it. And so they have to produce more and more roses. And this, there's this endless cycle that gets created uh, where you're forcing uh, more and more uh, production and consumption and assuming that greater happiness will flow. And precisely the opposite is starting to happen. So what if we grew fewer roses, compensated people fairly for mm -hmm. them, um, and didn't always give people roses for <laughs> we made handmade things or something. But the, the point would be that it, it's the value of what those roses represent, the food that it helps them purchase, or the education, or the me medicines that it helps them purchase. Here in the US, for example, in many places, uh, you've got parents who are in this relentless, how do we pay for college uh, cycle. and uh, as, a, as a country, we fail to invest public dollars in education. In fact, we're cutting back more and more at the higher levels of education at a time when, in the global economy, we should be investing more to allow uh, our future generations uh, to be uh, more competitive in this knowledge-oriented world. We are choosing instead to take that uh, money away and not invest it in higher education. And we're making people more anxious, and they have to do more things to earn more money to do what, or drive kids into debt. I mean, so many kids are graduating from college now in debt, paying that debt for years. So we are trapped in a system that is uh, 
supposed to be about choice and consumption, but it's driving us to despair in a sense. And we're replicating this on a global scale. So I think there's some simple starting steps we can take, but it does require uh, having the will to see it through uh, and the vision to see it through, the leadership to see it through, um, something that we need both here in the US and, uh, and globally. So on that somewhat despairing note, I have a great question uh, from the audience. And by the way, we have enough here. We're, we're going to go to 11 o'clock tonight. Is that OK? <laughs> no problem for everybody. There's so many good questions. Uh, but this is one that I was also particularly interested. How do you take the risk of using humor in your book? Um, well, uh, you know, I wanted this book to be um, very much in my voice um, and kind of with me as a character in it because I you know, I wanted people to feel like I wasn't lecturing them, um, that we were all kind of starting out from the same place, which was a place of not knowing, and that hopefully we would come to a greater understanding together. And um, I wanted it to feel like you were talking to your friend who, you know, has never met a detail she doesn't like, but um, <laughs> is maybe funny at times. Um, and so, it, you know, it felt to me like kind of, in a way, the most sort of natural way to do it. But, you know, it is risky, I guess. Um, you know, in I was very... Uh, honored uh, to be reviewed in the New York Times book review and that Bill McKibben reviewed my book and said that you know he didn't know a lot of the things in it which was I was very proud of that um, he also said <laughs> <laughs> he also said that uh, he found the rate of cutesy asides per page to be diabetic um, <laughs> so uh, I apologize for giving him diabetes but um, I <laughs> you know I, I that was a choice and um, you know, I think people my age, people younger than me, this is something we'll be living with for the rest of our lives. And, you know, to kind of put it in this box where it's it's always serious and it's always scary and there's nothing to laugh at, I feel like I don't want to deal with that kind of topic. <laughs> and, and also, you know, we still have to find, be able to find joy uh, and humor in the world around us because otherwise, you know, what do we have? Um, so to me, it felt, it felt actually I can't imagine kind of writing this book in a, in a different way. It's great. I, and I, like I said, I love those lines. There was one particular line where you were talking about international relations, but essentially, and we have a big international relations department um, on campus. And you said something like, oh, and they're, they just are, you know, they're acting like toddlers. That was your whole international. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, years of research has been done, and she like solved it. They, it's true. <laughs> they're acting like toddlers. So um, here's a related kind of question. Um, and it, it, also what made me think of this question was when you were going through the litany of, uh, in, your, in your last answer, of like the, the um, um, pollution, um, nutrification that causes these problems, that then causes these problems, it almost sounded like you were, have you considered writing a children's book about this topic? <laughs> this is their future and starting early to be informed is vital, to be informed responsibly. Yeah, people keep asking me about that yeah. and I, um, I think my book is appropriate for all ages. No, I. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I do. I do think that my that this particular book is probably accessible to high school students um, and college students for sure. I don't. You know, I don't ha have kids, so I don't know how to talk to kids about serious things. Um, <laughs> but it is. It's definitely something to to think about. I just. You know, I. And and that I I hope would be useful, but I also think. You know, they'll be growing up in a world where you can't, where this topic will be integrated into all other topics because of kind of how central it is. And so I wonder if, you know, I feel like even just thinking about the youth climate strike um, and the way that they talk about the changes that need to happen on a systemic and structural level, like they are already there. Um, and um, and I, I'm sure the same will be true, if not you know more true for younger generations, because they're thinking. You know, I feel like when I was in in high school, I mean, I saw an inconvenient truth. I think when I was a, a junior in high school, and so if, you know, it felt incredibly serious and important then. But it also felt like okay, that's climate change, and then there's everything else. Um, and I don't think that people really kind of have that that luxury anymore. And and I think young people are already kind of they they get that already. Mm -hmm. Here's a question for, for both of you. They're related, so I'm going to read them both. And it's a, it touches on the comments you both made on communicating and how to communicate. So one is, and this is somewhat it's the same numbers as your article, a recent survey said that 70% of Americans believe climate change is real and human-caused, yet they don't believe it affects them. Do you agree that we should stop worrying about the 30% deniers 
and focus on motivating the 70% to action. And the related question is, how do you recommend? Maybe the answer to the first question will say you don't. How do you recommend we talk about climate change with skeptics and climate change deniers? Well, I, I That's think... That's sort of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, there, there, now a majority of Americans uh, now know that it's uh, real, and they also actually, uh, not by such a large margin, but many, uh, I think it's, the number is about 60, 65% also understand that those climate impacts are here and now. This is not about some distant future. They're starting to see it in their lives already. Um, so I think it's not a question about getting people to say, uh, hey, do you think it's real or not? Do you, uh, are these the facts? But to move people to a solutions-oriented space, because a lot of the solutions we're talking about here are solutions that will deliver near-term benefits, uh, whether it's cutting pollution, delivering pu public health benefits, or building climate resilience to things like flooding and wildfires and uh, extreme heat. So. Uh, if that's where people are, uh, uh, let's absolutely move to the solution space. I, I think we should not lock ourselves into still having this quote unquote debate about things that are facts uh, right now. Yeah, I don't know how to talk to deniers um, because they live in a world where physics doesn't exist. So, um, <laughs> so it feels like we're. I don't know, that's a conversation that to me doesn't feel on the level. Um, and so I don't, it's, it's hard to kind of engage in that. But I, I think, you know, what we were talking about before, which is that you can still talk about kind of the, the policies and the benefits without getting into this conversation of whether or not we believe that this is true, because it is true. Um, and kind of, again, moving towards this, this solutions-oriented space. But I do think, um, you know, I, I, and it's, it's really interesting to, when you hear that people think that it is happening, but that it won't affect them. I wrote a story when I was at the New York Times about a, a town in um, England that had had kind of, you know, three one in a hundred year floods in the last five years. Um, and the people there were kind of moving back into their homes and rebuilding and, and saying things to me like, well, I don't care if it's climate change, I want to go home. And that, you know, you can completely understand that response. And it's really easy to, you know, for somebody who doesn't live in that place to say, well, you know, that's this is going to happen again and that's not a place for you to live and we need to relocate these communities and all that and there is kind of a deeply emotional element to this as well that I, and i think people it's really hard to to confront that and to deal with it and so um i think we have to make kind of space in that in this conversation for those kind of um very human and very difficult emotional aspects to this because it it, it isn't just kind of um you know kind of technology solutions and energy solutions and, and policy and um, you know, it is sort of these, it is the way that we live. And there's, I think, nothing kind of more personal and emotional than that. Um, maybe this is somewhat related to on a kind of spiritual, holy moly, it's like 1130 now, <laughs> at least. Um, thank you, by the way, all of you asking questions. And I should apologize from the beginning. We're not going to get to all of them. Um, so I'm really sorry. They're just fantastic. As you've seen me looking through them, they're wonderful questions. Um, so this is a question about Pope Francis, um, which, by the way, if you haven't read his encyclical um, on the environment, which came out in 2015, I believe, it's just a remarkable piece of a spiritual and religious leader putting a really important stake in the ground on all of this kind of intersectional issues about equity and the future um, and our children. It's, it, it's a remarkable piece, and I'd, I would strongly recommend reading it. The question is, Pope Francis has talked about indigenous people being stewards of the earth. Have you thought about land gifts to native peoples as a commitment to justice and climate recovery? And you can unpack that in way, there's such a deep question because it, you know, land gifts or, and it's I'm not just necessarily about indigenous people, but let me, what do you think about that? Yeah, there's no question that this is a moment where uh, you realize uh, the deep uh, knowledge of the land that uh, indigenous communities practice for uh, generations uh, to understand how to use the land sustainably, the water sustainably, uh, and to understand our place as human beings on this planet relative to the re other ecosystems and creatures around us. Uh, it's almost like the, the knowledge that was right there, we're having to relearn again uh, and, and understand again. So it's, it's a moment to really uh, take leadership and, and understand uh, 
uh, that that the solutions will come from uh, unexpected places. Uh, I think the the question of land rights is one that is uh, so uh, uh, well. It's a deep stain in our country's history uh, how we have treated indigenous populations here. Uh, our history uh, that continues to this day of discrimination and racism against uh, indigenous communities and communities of color. Uh, so. Absolutely, in the solutions that we're crafting now, um, we have to make sure that these are not top-down solutions, that communities are right at the table when uh, these solutions are being developed, and that uh, w a lot of people ultimately might have to move from places that are going to be really exposed to risk, whether it's in coastal floodplains or in places that are fire-prone or drought-prone. Uh, so we're going to have to think about this as uh, honestly uh, respecting uh, human rights not just here in the US, but as uh, communities around the world have to move out of harm's way, uh, they need places to go. And we as a country uh, have the luxury of land relative to the amount of people we have. So we need to think about what it'll mean to create welcoming communities uh, for people who might be forced to move. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, around the world, you know, indigenous communities a lot of the time because of how they live and interact with the landscape, I mean, they have known, they have been feeling climate change for decades. Um, and so they are already finding solutions in their communities. And so I think um, a really important thing to do is also to listen to those people. And, um, you know, as Rachel said, solutions might come from unexpected places, but to have those people involved in these conversations because they are already dealing with this problem, adapting to it, um, and finding solutions. And, um, and it, it is a, a knowledge base that, to our detriment, we overlook. Um, you know, I think in, in this country, particularly, um, I mean, I just, I guess I know it better, but I, I think it's, um, it's really complicated because a lot of the places where there are um, reservations are also places that are incredibly rich in the resources that we now find valuable that we didn't when they were made into reservations. Um, and so, you know, for instance, the, there's a, a mine, a uh, coal plant on the Navajo reservation that just closed last week. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a coal plant on the Navajo reservation. Um, it's hundreds of jobs for people who live on the reservation, um, but it is also, you know, this extractive and polluting um, resource and so but it is an enormous benefit to that community and so I, you know I think also those are those are other things to be mindful of as we think about kind of moving away from fossil fuels and moving towards a just transition is all the communities that are involved in, the, in those kinds of decisions and um, and kind of also um, adequately valuing those resources in that land and, and what they mean to the different communities that you know that, that live there. So um, I've got like a uh, speed round of questions because we've got a whole bunch of questions here about particular things. And so I, wanna, I want you to answer them like, um, yeah, it's really bad because of X, Y, and Z, or <laughs> it depends, which I'm sure is what your answer is going to be. Um, but like several people said, airline industry, you know, how bad is it? Bad. I mean, I... <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it is a real challenge that the elite of the world uh, are creating. Uh, most of those emissions are associated with very, very few people. Mm -hmm. So to me, I see a solution in that. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, organic, organic food. Well, it's a whole chapter in my book, so it's very complicated. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think. Um, I think we think that organic means something different from what organic actually means, because organic can also be industrial. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of a certification and regulation process as much as it is kind of a, a way of um, kind of farming sustainably. So I, I think that there it is, it is kind of sometimes a useful shorthand, but there are lots of other ways to, to farm and grow food sustainably that are not necessarily certified organic. So there are trade-offs. Yeah. How, about, how about new plant-based? Burgers and stuff. Oh, I haven't. I, I haven't tried them. Well, I wasn't asking how they tasted. <laughs> I like how they tasted, but I, I should I you know should I be concerned? You don't know. I, was, I don't know if you I should. Know, be, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's yes. Eat less beef. Yeah, eat less. Beef. It's yes. it's really important. No, I'm saying the plant-based new burgers, Impossible Burgers, Beyond Burgers. Those um, are not meat-based. Right. So, so those are good. Those are good. Okay. Except, except that they come with 
factory, non-sustainable other practices. We could just eat plants, you know. Right, that is yeah, true. <laughs> we have done that for millennia, haven't right. we? Yeah. <laughs> And me. Okay, Here's a, there's a whole series of questions, and, and maybe we don't want to make too fine a point on it, but there's a whole lot of questions that are about, like, wait, it's so obvious meat is damaging in this way. Oh, it's so obvious that coal ash is bad in this way. Oh, why aren't we, if we were to use our economic term, internalizing the externalities? Why aren't we regulating these in ways that are more sustainable to the future? What's the quick answer to that, if there is a quick answer? Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Go a little bit more in detail. <laughs> um, you know, I think there, like these systems, a lot of the time, and, and something that I read about in the book is like this often becomes a question of scale, um, and that these systems become so big and so kind of entrenched as to seem unsolvable. So, um, you know, there's like a whole thing about how you know McDonald's they you know, they buy like a huge percentage of the potatoes that are grown here and they only want this one kind of potato because that produces a longer french fry, which is what we've come to expect as consumers. But that particular potato gets this certain kind of like stain in it that can only be solved by using this pesticide that is really presents a lot of nat problems to the ecosystem in terms of biodiversity loss and all these sorts of other things. So like so that, that's what I mean, you know, in terms of kind of how the scale kind of, so now there are millions of people who's like, people who are eating McDonald's, people who work at McDonald's, people who grow the potatoes, people who produce the pesticides. It, it just becomes kind of this enormous economic system that's really hard to disentangle. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that it, you know, even though these problems do seem so obvious and it seems like, well, why can't they just have a different type of potato, they could. <laughs> but you know, that, that requires kind of a major shift in also our consumer expectations, um, even if we think we don't have them. I think it's our consumer culture. It really, what we have internalized is more is better and new is better. Um, and there's just, uh, the market is delivering solutions to us that uh, are designed to be throwaway. And that means you need a new phone, you need a new computer, you need a new, every, a uh, couple of years and you really become a, a complete outlier because the whole system is like a self-generating machine and then if you're this person who has a phone that's four years old you're suddenly but it's also where we are and the circles in which we uh, move and operate for if, if you just step out of the bubble for a little bit travel and go somewhere else uh, and live uh, in a more simple environment you'll realize, oh my God, I actually didn't need those 500 things <laughs> that uh, you know, feel like necessities uh, when you're living in a certain environment. So this is why collective uh, decision choices are important. Transportation's an important one where we're seeing a shift. A lot of young people these days actually don't want to own cars and don't want to deal with all of that. Um, so it's a, it's a moment where you can think about what else could we have in the mix instead of just Ubers and Lyfts. Could we be thinking about sustainable transportation? So we only have about five more minutes, and uh, I thought it, it might be nice uh, for each of us to have a kind of summary statement, but we'll end with Tatiana, who should have the last word here with this awesome audience. So Rachel, what, what, how would you kind of sum up your thoughts from this evening? Well, I'm just amazed to see all of you here. I just, uh, I mean, the book is amazing. It's a cold night out there, though, and I, I really appreciate that so many of you have shown up. And to me, uh, the, it's rooms like this and conversations like this that lead to that collective action that we've been talking about here. You all clearly individually care um, about the kinds of choices and their implications uh, for the world that we're leaving our, our children and grandchildren. Uh, but now we have a little bit of knowledge to what we can do collectively to, uh, to change uh, what's happening out there. And uh, to me, ultimately, it, it does really come back to having a world uh, that is, yes, uh, limiting the risk of climate change and pollution, but also a world where we can look our children and grandchildren in the eye and say we really did our utmost. Uh, not that, you know what, between the texts I was sending and something, I did something on the side. But really, we cared and we did our utmost. So this is one of those moments that's come along uh, that we uh, have to rise to the occasion around. And we need leadership uh, at, in our government that uh, understands the moment that we're in. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll all be inspired by what you heard here and, and uh, go back into your communities and start making some of those changes. Thank you. 
So I, I, I've been, both by reading the book and the, being in this conversation, um, there's like a paradox of the complexity that you write about um, that can feel um, like a roadblock to solutions. And yet, the connectivity, sort of as Rachel was saying earlier, allows for some pretty exciting um, policy and decision making that I think can really move the ball forward. And having been in state government for 10 years where we struggled with almost every issue in your book, punted on many of them, the embedded, uh, I'll talk to you about embedded pollution from China, total punted on that. Um, complicated, I'm not gonna get into it. But on many of the other issues, we tried to seek these kind of win, 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 win situations and we would talk, to, talk about them that way. Um, and uh, while we might feel that there aren't answers out there, there are. All over the world there have been solutions to these kinds of problems, both locally, nationally, and regionally, and internationally. Paris Accord is one of those kinds of things. Um, so the education that you're striving for in this book, I think, is a really important part of this conversation that we need to be having. We here, we throughout the world, um, and um, it's exactly the, the complexities, I think, that are going to be part of what makes, uh, makes this solvable. And the way that you approach these um, with the humor that you do, I think, makes it particularly accessible. So I really am I'm grateful that, uh, for this book in this space right now. Thank you. Um, I, um, so one of the, the ways throughout my life that I've been able to connect to my, to my family and to my relatives um, is by studying history. Um, and, you know, I studied history as, a, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. And, um, I mean, you know, I think kind of wanting to connect to, to my grandparents in particular um, kind of inspired that. But it, it really has been something that I, um, I mean, it's, I, has, um, I mean, it's my main intellectual interest. And I think if, when you read the book, even though it's not a history book, there is really actually a lot of history in it. And um, that's because that's what I love. Um, and, you know, so it's, I, it's hard for me to be here and not be thinking about, um, you know, my family and, and um, what their legacy has inspired, or my grandfather in particular has inspired in me. Um, and uh, Rachel mentioned before, earlier about, um, you know, my grandfather's work to create the um, Cape Cod National Seashore um, and other national seashores and also his support of, or his administration's support of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Um, but, you know, one thing that I have, have thought about, um, you know, in, in reading a lot of environmental history and, and studying this, this problem um, is that, you know, climate change may be a kind of especially intense and new environmental problem, but we've been dealing with versions of it for as long as there have been people. Um, and, you know, my grandfather dealt with it in his time, you know, I think most poignantly in his speech um, at American University after the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, in which he said a lot of things. But, you know, at the end, we all inhabit the same small planet and we all cherish our children's future. Um, and I think that is, um, I think that that's really what we're all talking about, which is that, um, you know, we are, we are trying to all build a, a more just society and a better planet for people to live on. Um, and, and we all have an interest in doing that. Um, and so, you know, that is a kind of guiding and important principle for me, and I'm very happy to get to, to share it with all of you. So thank you again for coming. Great. Please, please join me in thanking Rachel Cletus and Tatiana Sosberg. Awesome.